So I will be extremely brief. Um, I have the honor and pleasure of working with a lot of smart students, researchers, and other folks in the position I have. So I get to introduce all of them, um, and I will just jump up in between each one. So if you're playing Civic Media Bingo, now is the time to play. You will win very quickly. There's a lot of cool projects touching a lot of things that I know people in the room are interested in. So we're going to go ahead and get started with Nathan Mathias, who is now a PhD student here in the Center for Civic Media. Nathan? Hi, I'm Nathan, and I do uh, data analysis, uh, design, and experiments on cooperation online. And I'll be sharing Newspad, a project that I started at Microsoft Research, and Eventful, which my colleagues, colleagues carried on. And both of these projects are related to this idea that Zynep used of building community through reporting. Imagine the attention curve of News Online, all the way from Kim and Kanye to an individual tweet. We know that news organizations and Wikipedia can cover the left end of the curve really well, and that curation tools can cover stories that at least have a few tweets about them, but there is a huge need for work uh, and tools that support things that haven't yet been tweeted about and things in the middle of that curve, things like the Capitol Hill a garage sale, this profoundly important community building event in Seattle that doesn't really get reported by the mainstream news even in Seattle. To start out, Shelley Farnham and Emma Spiro did, developed new algorithms for detecting uh, community and neighborhood-based Twitter activity and looked at the different shapes and structure of networks in different communities to find ways to uh, help people collaboratively create news. Uh, we know that cooperative systems like Wikinews can help at the left end of the cur curve, but curation tools are tend, tend to be single user and aren't very collaborative, which is where we came up with the idea for Newspad. Imagine once an event happens, maybe there's some sparse media, someone creates a Newspad post that anyone can read and edit live. People can also recruit others to contribute to this post, and important sites within the community can embed the article and the editing tools into the different parts of the community to create a positive feedback loop that brings more readers and more contributors to the post. Here's how it works. We help novice creators create a news article uh, by helping them generate a listicle-style news title and then structure their article in a way that's easy to contribute to. Uh, we also structure participation by inviting contributors to list their names take concrete tasks like ask for improvements, offer to help, read the article. And we ask, ask people to check into the article to say they're willing to help, even if they're not sure how yet. And then using social recruitment, uh, we have every single section in the article linked to the ability to ask your friends on Twitter or ask people via email to contribute to the article. Over the last summer, we started with uh, small prototypes using actual print cards in the neighborhood and then moved on to cover a wide variety of events in Seattle and elsewhere, including last year's Civic Media Conference. Uh, building on this idea, Newspad really had the idea of trying to uh, streamline the recruitment and collaborative editing process. Andres and Elena designed a system to structure different tasks that people can take to contribute to a news story. So they broke individual stories into concrete tasks that different people can complete. The idea is that you can you go to Eventful, request an event to be covered, say what type it is, how long it's going to last. It will then create a checklist of different tasks that are, need to be com completed to write the story. Those tasks can be sent to community members by your community mailing list, and they can also be sent to TaskRabbit using dynamically allocated labor pools to fill in the gaps. So the task grabbers go to the event, they have a checklist of things they need to do, interview people, get information, take video. That's then passed to a curator who looks at the tasks, approves of the work, sends more tasks back as the story evolves, and then puts it into the story. Here's a screenshot of the system, which you can see now on Eventful, uh, it, that gives people a mission-based view of the tasks they need as a group to write the story. And then that story can be fed into systems like Newspad, uh, into a common story, and shared back out to the community in that positive feedback loop that I described previously. Newspad has been open sourced by Microsoft, and I'm doing ongoing work on it. And you can contact Andres and Elena for more information about their projects. Thanks.
Thanks, Nathan. Um, if you want to think about how to make your projects more collaborative, talk to Nathan. He's an expert at that. Um, so next up, we have Catherine Dignazio, who I've had the pleasure of working with over the last couple of years. Catherine? Hi, I'm back. Uh, so if journalism is based on the who, what, where, when, why, how, I have been working on the where of the news for the past couple of years at the Center for Civic Media. So one really exciting I ha announcement I have to make is that Rahul Bhargav and I have recent released, uh, recently released a technology called Cliff, uh, which is an open source geoparsing technology. And it's called Cliff because it's based on a technology called Claven. So you might be like, <laughs> what's geoparsing? Uh, so geoparsing is the process of extracting place data from unstructured text like news articles. What that helps us do is look at news stories at scale and come to conclusions about long-term patterns, trends, and biases in media attention across news sources. So for example, your research might be inquiring what kind of coverage towns in greater Boston are getting, or a geographic media analysis of the Boston Marathon bombings, or an interactive tool that helps media researchers search for stories with geographic dimensions. But the challenge that I wanted to take up for the culmination of my research here is around an idea that Ethan Zuckerman talks about at the end of his book, Rewire. How can we engineer serendipity? So the very quick argument for why this is important is as follows. The internet arrived with a lot of hopes and dreams for civic engagement and cosmopolitanism. Increased ac access to information, increased tolerance for diversity, global citizenship. And today, we do have unprecedented access to information. However, researchers like Ethan and others show us how homophily the tendency for, those to, for us to group ourselves with those most like us is alive and well on the internet as it is in physical space. This is combined with greedy corporate data collection and personalization algorithms that guess what you want and filter accordingly. So the internet technologies that most enable our internet our, our informational selves, powerful search algorithms like Google, social sharing sites like Facebook, or recommendation systems like Amazon, are the ones that reinforce our homophily through personalization by giving us what we want, what our friends want, and what people like us want. So I want to show you my very small experiment in this space because it's a really big you know, sort of area of possibility. My project is called Terra Incognita, 1,000 Cities of the World, and it's a project I'm working on with Matt Stempek uh, from the center. So it's a serendipitous global news recommendation system and game. It's based around exploring news about what we have deemed the 1,000 most important cities in the world. It's a, uh, an extension for the Chrome browser. It's live in the web store now. So when a user opens a new tab in her browser, Terra Incognita presents her with a map of one of these 1,000 cities, along with recommended news stories about that place. So here's a quick tour of the user interface. Um, the main components are that it shows you a city that you have not yet ever read about. And then there's a couple of options for interaction. There's the equivalent of the I'm feeling lucky button, and then several options for scanning news headlines and looking at news recommendations. So it looks sort of like this for the city of Xiamen, China. So you can see that there are five things to read. And those five things take you to articles from uh, foreign policy, uh, articles from Wikipedia, two government websites, and an article from Global Voices about protesters. Uh, sorry. Oh my goodness. OK. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Oh my. So in any case, um, the one interesting thing about this project was that we needed to source many, many news recommendations. And we needed them for the 1,000 cities in the world. Um, we sourced them from many multiple locations. So we took data from Instapaper, from other users browsing history in the system. We ran a crowdsource campaign. We used human curators. And we used live real-time APIs like Bitly. We prioritized alternative and local media news sources over, over mainstream media. and 
Even so, I have to say, there are huge numbers of blind spots. One of the takeaways from this project is that it is actually still really difficult to get information in English about certain places in the world. So I want to share with you some of the preliminary user study results that have come out. I, I, we haven't published these quite yet, but um, what it shows that is that 62.5% of users show an increase in geographic diversity of news reading after installing Terra Incognita. Um, and a really important kind of second Secondary finding is that 55% of people are actually reading more news in general, just any kind of news. It doesn't necessarily have to have a geographic dimension or not. So really encouraging and interesting results. Um, so our next steps is we do want to kind of complete the study, do another round of development, and talk to all of you about um, fun, serendipitous ways to engage with kind of getting outside of ourselves in terms of finding information. Um, so I'd love to talk further with you all. You can find me in the fall um, in the Emerson Department of Journalism, where I'm going to be a professor of civic media and data visualization. And there's my contact info. Thanks so much. <laughs>
every country pretty much shares at least one video trend with every other country. And uh, it's, it's decentralized. The, the videos that two countries share are different from the videos that two other countries share. So this, this shows that there's no particular, uh, tr there are no particular trendsetter nations here, and that vid uh, videos are definitely crossing boundaries. Uh, but if you zoom in on the differences, interestingly enough, you actually see structures uh, that reflect pre-existing cultural and geographic boundaries. So you see a large cluster of the Western world. Uh, then you see clusters for the Arab world, Sub-Saharan Africa, Russia and Ukraine, etc. cetera. Uh, and one thing that we see here is that uh, countries that are both central to clusters, like Australia, Canada, and New Zealand, have high migration as do the bridges, like the United Arab Emirates, that connects the Arab world to the rest of the world. And here is the most uh, widely shared video in, in our data set. It turns out not to be a cute cat, but a cute baby uh, that was uh, listening to its mother sing and cycling through a range of emotions, crying, singing, crying again. And that hit 54 countries in our data set. So you can use this now at whatwewatch.mediameter.org. And I'm happy to chat with you uh, either here or on Twitter. Thank you. So like I said, Ed, Ed and I work together to support almost all of these projects. Um, so he's been invaluable in that way. In addition, he's also one of the best people I know at explaining complicated mathematical concepts in simple terms, I think, as he just experienced. So that's incredibly helpful to me. So next up, we have Chelsea Barros. And um, Chelsea, you want to come up? Hello. So I'm going to share with you a little bit about my current research for my master's thesis. So in 1987, um, the New York Times took a poll asking Americans if they still believed it was possible to be born poor, to work hard, and then end up rich. At the time, 57% of Americans said yes. Two decades later, amidst the worst financial crisis that we've ever seen in our lifetimes, in my lifetime, um, that number had actually increased to 72%. So um, even though you know, our politics in this country are pretty polarized, it seems like there's one kind of belief that most Americans still kind of believe in, uh, the belief in the American meritocracy. Access to educational opportunity is kind of at the foundation of this idea. However, in recent times, we've seen the cost of a college degree skyrocket, while the return on that investment has steadily diminished. Um, so yeah, today, about um, the average college graduate graduates with $33,000 of debt. Um, meanwhile, unemployment and underemployment are at all-time highs. What's worse, though, is that these hardships aren't evenly distributed across the population. So today, African-American college graduates have double the unemployment rates of the rest of their peers who graduate from college. Also, recent research has shown that um, <clears throat> disturbing trends of downwards mobility for uh, people who graduate from college who came from the bottom quintile of uh, the household income bracket. So amidst this kind of dire background, it's interesting that we've seen a surge in optimism over the potential for higher education to be re-democratized with the rise of the internet and for new opportunities to emerge for us to access riches and, and, and stake out a path for ourselves. <clears throat> so I'm talking about the stories of the guys who leave college and pursue of their next big idea and also teach themselves to code and other really great skills using the internet. But I'm also talking about the stories of the underdog, the kids from r rural and remote places in the world who are now able to access um, resources from some of the most elite academic institutions in the world and then get into them. At the heart of this story is um, really the tech industry, and perhaps rightfully so. Um, there have been groups of programmers and hackers who have really created a lot of really vibrant resources in online communities for people to be sharing advice and help each other in practical and applied problem solving. This has led for, um, to a lot of leaders within tech to really describe tech as kind of the new frontier of meritocracy in the world. However, um, there's been a growing kind of concern going on about like, the lack of diversity within the tech sector. So as many of you probably know, Google just recently re released its workforce statistics, which show that still largely today, um, the workforce within tech is largely white, largely male which is kind of showing us that even today's kind of world of open and free online resources, the protagonist of the meritocracy story is still kind of the same as it's always been. 
At the same time, though, there's some really interesting experiments going on right now, specifically within tech, trying to broaden this growing sector to um, more accessible for more people. So there are interesting platforms kind of emerging, trying to be do better partnerships between um, people, uh, companies who um, really want to recruit people with more marketable skill sets, um, developing curriculum that is more practical and applied that people can actually do while they're actually working full time, as well as organizations that are trying to develop cohorts for groups that are right now underrepresented in the sector, trying to create a more vibrant social uh, support network for people to learn outside of uh, a formalized classroom setting. <laughs> So this summer, I'm actually focusing my research on understanding what are these kind of new and emerging learning pathways that people are trying to take in order to actually become software engineers or web developers within the tech industry. To do this, I'm actually partnering with uh, a recent recipient of the Knight News Fellow uh, Grant, um, Code2040. I'm going to be spending the summer with them and the 27 fellows that they're bringing to San Francisco and Silicon Valley. And I'm going to be learning from them, really, how are they taking that first leap of applying what they've learned um, to their very first job within the tech sector. Uh, these, these guys are really amazing. I've already spent three weeks with, with them so far. Um, and they come from really a wide range of backgrounds. So some of them are computer science majors at Stanford. Um, and other ones are working part time and going to community college and have really taught themselves to code um, uh, on their own. So I'm going to be working with them to really understand uh, some of their experiences as they're learning in their internships. I'm also going to be talking to thought leaders and HR professionals within the field to understand a little bit more about um, how they're thinking about diversity in their recruitment processes and how they're thinking about this idea of meritocracy in their work. So here are some of the key research themes. I'm running out of time, got 12 seconds. So, um, you know, the, the big, the meat of it is really, um, really wanting to understand how this ecosystem of higher education is changing and what are the social and economic factors that are really shaping who has access to, to these pathways and translating those into opportunities in the future. So, out of time, would love to talk about this more. Thanks. So it's hard to overstate how much we value the sort of sociological and anthropological, anthropological focus and lens that, uh, that folks like Chelsea can bring to not only this project, but a variety of projects. So that said, we're about to get nerdy. So put on your hats, and I'd like to welcome up Sanz and Ali to speak about their work. Ali Hashmi, Center for Civic Media, MIT Media Lab grad student. I'm Sans Fish. I work at the Center for Civic Media and the Berkman Center for Internet and Society. So in our world, data is ubiquitous, and it is sometimes hard to make sense of it. So it is very much like this exhibit, uh, Book from the Sky, which remains inaccessible to us without a narrative. So our goal was to provide a narrative inside for large amounts of data in contextual frames comprising keywords. This is essentially a discourse-based approach because it treats media and data as a form of representation. Our algorithm essentially uh, treats it as clusters of, uh, it, it discovers clusters of topics comprising keywords using a noun phrase approach. And uh, the intuition behind this is very simple, that we can uh, tease out uh, topical themes through statistical means. So we're lucky enough to be working with this amazing platform called Media Cloud, which has a massive amount of online news media. It's been collecting it for five or six years now. Um, just a really massive source um, and a great system that allows you to basically target a search, um, use keywords, use a date time range, and maybe a particular type of media source. So we've broken things out into uh, mainstream media, uh, left-leaning blogs and right-leaning blogs, and a number of other categories. So you can focus in your search, but what you get even with a keyword search, just like in Google, is just a massive amount of documents. So if you're a citizen journalist, if you're a researcher, any of the people that have access to this system, you still have a really hard time teasing out what the frames, what the conversations are. So we have been running our algorithm on this to try and tease some of these out on the NSA and the neutrality controversies. And what you see is, um, even in this really early work, some very clear themes. So this first one that we have here uh, focuses much more on the government. Um, we have Obama, we have policy, um, freedom is in there, um, and technology a bit. So these are not very, very specific frames. They're 
conversations that are going on that you use as a starting point for learning what's going on and how to proceed with your research. Um, the second one we have here is much more about technology. So you see internet, um, uh, let's see, neutrality, uh, access, company, data. This is much more the technical frame. This is much more about uh, what the technology is involved and what this, um, the vocabulary that people use that are, that are in the know, basically, for this particular conversation. Um, the third one stands out a lot more uh, in terms of what the conversation to the public is. So you can see vocabulary here that's being used to describe this to people who are um, perhaps like lay people. So the big one is Netflix. So everybody's heard this, um, this refrain in the neutrality debate that says your Netflix is going to be slow. Um, and this along with some of the other um, companies that are up here, so you see Apple, you see Google in there, subscriber. Um, this is a very uh, distinct con um, conversation that's going on. So essentially, uh, the, this tool will be actually accessible through uh, Media Cloud Dashboard, and Ed and Rahul are going to talk about that in the next section. All right, we'd love to talk to yeah. anybody that's interested in this, so uh, come find us. All right, so um, I'm back with Ed this time. Um, so our the next presentation is connected enough that we're going to jump right into it. Um, so as you heard about the Media Cloud Platform, it's something that actually was developed by the, uh, by the Berkman Center over at Harvard. And of course, Ethan has worked with them for a long period of time. So Media Cloud has, is this giant database of news articles that have been collected for some of them over 10 years. So we have you know, huge amounts of online news reporting. And that's enabled a ton of really fundamental and interesting media studies research. And you see these projects coming out of the Berkman Center as deep dives along a couple of dimensions. You see things like trying to understand how the Russian blogosphere is working. So you see things like understanding the great paper that um, Erhard and Matt and Ethan, of course, worked on about understanding how Trayvon Martin, that story, moved from a local story to something that Obama was commenting on. You see a lot of deep, sort of hugely deep dives coming out of this. And that's great. And we sort of is, is made possible by the database that exists in Media Cloud. That said, it's also a high burden, right? That type of research is very hard to do. And the technologies behind it are also sort of have a, a, a high learning curve. So after a while, we had enough requests that we said, all right, we, we need to fix this problem. And this is a great touch point for us at the Center for Civic Media to collaborate with our friends at Berkman. And the fruit of that collaboration is a platform that we're calling Media Meter. And Media Meter is, of course, built on top of Media Cloud and is a little bit closer to front-facing tools that people can use to actually do some of this research themselves. So Ed is going to describe some of what it does, and then I'll tell you about where we're going with it. All right, so Media Meter is, uh, like Rahul said, a suite of tools and a framework. The jumping off point is something we've designed called Media Meter Dashboard. And that does two things. It, it allows you to construct queries. It allows you to say what keywords you're interested in, uh, what date range, uh, which media sources, if you want to look at a particular subset of the media sources. And it lets you see results from widgets that represent all of the Media Meter tools uh, all on the same screen at the same time. So you can look at the same data in many different ways to see uh, in which ways it's interesting. Uh, like I said, you can, you can query uh, a single topic. You can actually query uh, two topics to compare as well. Um, so I'll jump in and talk about all of the uh, individual tools. We have three that we've built to start with. Uh, the first one is called Mentions, and it very simply looks for mentions of your subject in the media online, and it tells you where it was mentioned, and it gives you uh, the sentence it was mentioned in. You can then click that and read the entire article if you want more context. Uh, Pulse is built on top of some of the work uh, from Erhard Graef on Attention Plotter, and it lets you track the uh, ebb and flow of mentions, the number of mentions, of uh, the subjects you're interested in over time. Uh, these examples are uh, soccer versus football, by the way. <laughs> uh, 
this is one of my favorite examples. Um, uh, you can see 52 little bumps, so it, it's something that everyone talks about every week, uh, except, for, except for over the holidays. This is actually searching for denies in uh, mainstream media. Uh, the next widget is called Frequency. It, uh, it was developed by an undergraduate who worked with us named Deborah Chen at the Center for Civic Media. And it lets you see what other words are mentioned uh, when someone is talking about a particular subject. And if you have two queries, it lets you see whether a word is mentioned in both or whether it's mentioned in one or the other. And like I said, this is a framework, and we're currently extending it, and uh, a lot of the work is not just what we've done, but what's coming forward. And Rahul's going to tell you more about that. So this is the, the dashboard tool is available in uh, limited beta right now, and I'll give the URL in a second. But this is just the start of sort of the, the summer trajectory into the fall. Each of these little widgets that you see here is going to turn into a full-fledged tool to help scaffold the media analysis tasks that, that we are sort of trying to help people do. Um, so, for instance, Pulse is going to turn into a deeper tool that we've been calling Attention Plotter before, where you can integrate other things like closed caption mentions, your own CSVs, and actually dig into understanding how the whole media ecosystem is talking about something. Um, Frequency will be a more interactive tool that you can click around on. And the mentions will let you download the list of stories so you can do your own research on it. So each of those is getting fleshed out more, and we're extending it over the summer into the fall as well. So the work that Catherine Dignaggio mentioned about Cliff which is the tool we've built for geoparsing and looking at what a story is about, what place, that is actually going to turn into a tool where you'll be able to have the same kind of access where hopefully every story in that database will be able to tell you what place it's about and what places are mentioned there. So you could do queries based on that as well. Similarly, the great work that you just heard from Ali and Sans is going to be integrated in some way so that if you find something really interesting, maybe you can do a topic detection on that and then get the results and see if that helps you figure stuff out. Um, and like I said, that's the sort of suite that we're building out. So if you're curious about that and want to try it, please hit the website and sign up um, to get access. Right now it's limited beta because we're trying to sort of make sure the infrastructure works before we uh, sort of open it up. But if you get on that waiting list, we'll pull you off of it. And uh, come talk to either Ed or myself about it a bit more. Thank you very much. So next up, that was a little heady, uh, a little bit research focused. So next up, we're going to get something that's a little more practical. Um, so I'll invite Tal up to tell us about that. Thanks, Rahul. So uh, just a quick show of hands. How many of you are interested in what the police is doing? OK, I thought so. So um, this all started around the Boston Marathon bombings. And I was wondering to myself, uh, I'm a ham radio operator, and I was listening on, to, on the scanners, and there was a lot of information out there that was obviously reported before the TV stations reported it, but also a lot of information that nobody reported on. And I was wondering why that happens, and I called up a, a friend of mine at the Boston Globe, and I said, how do you deal with this over information overload? How do you handle all of these channels, all that data? And she didn't know how to answer it, but she forwarded me to another person who didn't know how to answer it, and finally I got to the guy that's sitting next to the scanner, and... He's just alone there, and you know, if something happens, he alerts someone. But there's no, there, at least there, and in many other news organizations, no kind of proactive approach to this. When something really big happens, um, they ask for the information from the police, and we'll touch on a couple of problems with that uh, shortly. Um, so this is what the newsroom looked like in 1940, and this is what it looks like today. A lot of differences. Um, and this is one of the tools that reporters used, and this is the tool used today. Also, a lot of differences. This is the police scanner that was introduced in 1976, um, and this is the one they use today. It's cheaper and faster, but otherwise, it lets you listen to one channel at a time, live, and nothing much more than that. So, um, the question is, how do we allow access to this information? The primary point of uh, importance is being aware of what's happening around you. Um, and also ownership. So it's kind of weird that when you want to investigate the police, you have to go to the police and ask them for these recordings that when they were live were public domain, just because nobody's keeping records. Some ham operators and, and some journalists built their own tools, but there's nothing that's really oriented towards journalists. <coughs> Excuse me. 
Also, there are commercial tools out there. The police is obviously using something to record the conversations, but they are expensive and you need technicians to operate them. Then there's the question of access. So let's say you got the data. The police sent you 17 CDs of channel one through five, hours one through four, channel five through six, hour one through four. Who has the time to go through all that data? If you had access, the, the thesis here is that if you had access to this immediately, you would utilize it more and you'd be more effective and you'd be able to get more news out of it. And then, how do you, how do you analyze it? Once, once you have it, it needs to be a group activity. Um, you, there needs to be collaboration on this, both within the newsroom, uh, across newsrooms in the same network, and across competitors sometimes. For example, in the Boston Marathon bombings, you could hear the, the radio channels here in Boston, but not in New York, and um, the Boston uh, local outlets could have used help from other reporters to analyze all this data, live or semi-live. So the solution is an open source uh, hardware and software platform that very cheaply allows uh, to create a TiVo-like mechanism that lets the newsroom, first of all, record everything at the first stage. That's what we're working on now. Second of all, allow for a collaboration on the analysis of the data. And in the future, to transcribe it and allow it to search not only by channel and time, but also other types of analytics. How often does the Boston police say 15 Main Street? And when is the last time they said 15 Main Street and why? Um, for example, uh, let me show you a quick overview of what we have now. It's uh, an overly engineered display, but just to give a, a, a proof of concept and to help you understand a little bit of behind the scenes and where uh, this might go. Also, we are looking for people to collaborate on this. If your newsroom is interested in exploring this, talk to us. We want to be, want to make sure this tool gets used. Um, and helps journalists actually get their work done. If we build this in a way that requires a new employee to sit down next to this tool, obviously nobody's gonna use it. So we're trying to learn how you access the scanner today and how we can replace it. So really quickly, uh, this is from the lab. Um, this is what a single channel looks like. This is in lab conditions. This is my daughter's baby monitor. And uh, so the, the horizontal axis is frequencies and the vertical axis is time, and you can see that she coughed five times and then twice later on. Um, this is what it looks like in real life. These are police channels. You can see that there's chatter on four channels and really quick call on another channel. Imagine what happens right now is you're living at the top bar and you're hearing live. And if you're listening to one channel, you're definitely missing another. When you see this, and obviously we need to make it a display that's, that's, that's a quest, the answer we need from you guys, what should it look like? If you see this, and imagine you can click on any point in time, 30 minutes ago, an hour ago, and listen to what happened there and then. Just that, I think, would be a, a great tool. Looking forward to hearing from you guys. Thank you very much. So that's a great example of some of the things that we can try to do to actually work on the real problems that some of the folks in this room are, are struggling with. Um, one of the other pleasures that I have is working with all these folks that have talents in a lot of different domains. So for instance, Ali is actually well-trained as both a computer scientist and a journalist. So he and Julia are going to come up and speak about one of the more journalism-focused proje projects they've been working on. Hello. Hi, everyone. So I'm Julia Blues. I'm a health reporter and night science journalism fellow here at MIT. Ali Hashmi, Center for Civic Media. Um, so today we're talking about this question, can big data save health journalism? So the problem, as you all probably know, health reporters like me, we don't always do a great job of reflecting science or the things that actually uh, impact public health. You've seen the stories on chocolate and wine and coffee. They're your friends one week and your foes the next week. Um, but what do you think, what actually kills Americans? So you in the audience, tell me, what do you think are the top causes of mortality in America? Anything else? Heart disease. Okay, we have a smart audience today. So according to the latest CDC figures, it's cancer, heart disease, and chronic respiratory diseases like emphysema and bronchitis. But um, how, does it, how are these things actually reported in the media? So Ali and I just did this quick search of the New York Times um, for the keyword cancer, health stories in the last 12 months. 4,200 mentions, so cancer's um, mentioned a lot. But emphysema, one of the key chronic respiratory um, conditions that are one of the leading causes of death in America, four results in the last year. So uh, we started to think as journalists, 
could we use this data in a way that might actually help reporters see these gaps and blind spots in their coverage or see places that they might uh, pay more attention to and issues, that might, uh, issues of health that might actually matter to their audiences. So Ali and I created this, the health gap. Um, it's a prototype now that we're building. And you can see on the top um, from the scroll down menu, um, you can choose diseases and then you, the, the mortality in the populations visualized and the mentions in the New York Times um, are visualized as well, and you can see very clearly that there's a gap, for example, between chronic lower respiratory diseases and then the little tiny number of stories uh, that are mentioned in the New York Times about uh, chronic respiratory conditions. Um, and So we have found similar trends in uh, other countries as well. Uh, here is an example from India, where we're actually looking at uh, disease burden and uh, neonatal diseases, which have a huge disease burden in India, are not adequately covered in the leading newspaper uh, Times of India. We're using sources like Media Cloud, LexisNexis, and other big data sources to, uh, to actually consolidate uh, data across different media sources. And, but we want to build up from here. We're ambitious people. We think that there's a lot of opportunity to gather different types of data and help um, maybe inform journalists and editors on, and kind of help them see where there might be, again, these blind spots and gaps. So we want to expand the focus beyond the countries that we're looking at now. We only had data from the leading newspapers in India, Canada, and the US, but we hope to include other countries. We hope to add more media outlets, and most importantly, we want to create a feature that makes this tool interactive so that reporters and journalists from any news outlet can download their data um, and then compare it to key indicators like mortality, DALI's uh, disability adjusted life years, which are the disease burden in the population, and other things like, um, one thing that would be really interesting would be uh, getting research investment, so public kind of seeing where there's gaps between where a population is investing uh, its resources in research, and then where journalists might be missing opportunities to report on that research that uh, their citizens are investing in anyway. Um, so that's where we're going with this, and right now you can see um, the latest version at healthgap.brownbag.me. And please keep in touch and send us any of your comments or questions um, at our contact info there. Thanks so much. Thanks. So that's one of the sort of a handful of examples that you've seen around taking the data that we've been able to acquire in lots of different places or create and driving action, in this case, journalist action. So the, the next speaker, William Lee, is also another example of using data to drive some action. William? Great, thanks Rahul. Good morning, my name is William Lee and I'm a PhD student in computer science here at MIT. I want to talk to you today about a particular project, Build Tracer, that came out of Ethan's class on the future of news and civic media, and some thoughts on analyzing open government data. So this is part of page one of 848 pages of the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act. And as smart as this audience is, it's probably the case that most of us did not read all 848 pages. So can we use some kind of data science, machine learning, text analysis to help us understand government systems and processes? And that's what I want to walk you through today. So this is another bill related to the financial crisis, the Troubled Asset Relief Program, or TARP. This was passed on October 3rd, 2008, after the collapse of AIG to bail out uh, the banks with $700 billion. And what I've done here is I've represented each of the 39 sections of this bill just as dots, just the text of those sections. And what I can do then is I can start to trace back to all the bills introduced in this particular Congress and see what was introduced. And every time there's a, match, a sufficiently matching section of text in another bill, I'll make another dot as well. And so we can start to walk backwards. You might recall there was a failed House vote in the, uh, failed vote in the House of Representatives and the Dow Jones dropped 780 points. This was what was included in that bill. And I can keep tracing back all the way and sort of see 
what was included in this particular bill. And then we can look at it and see what was included, finally, what got into TARP. So what you can see here is there was an energy bill that sort of got in. There was a stalled uh, alternative minimum tax bill that uh, got into TARP as well. And finally, the reauthorization of the Secure Rural Schools and Community Self-Determination Act of 2000 to get enough votes uh, for, for TARP or the Emergency Economic Stabilization Act to pass. And so we can do the same thing then for other bills, say related to the financial crisis. In some cases, bills have lots of new content. content. So in the stimulus bill, after a new presidential administration, perhaps not surprisingly, most of the content is new, except something about electronic health records. This is the Housing and Economic Recovery Act, where the federal government took over Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. And you can see with these some of these regulations were considered for fairly long periods of time. And returning to Dodd-Frank, this is Dodd-Frank. So here you can see there are certain regulations related to swaps or the antitrust savings clause and gives us a sense of uh, what was considered in Congress and for what periods of time. As a small mini extension of this, it's possible to look forward uh, in time and take a look at, say, a bill that was passed maybe by the House or the Senate, but didn't make it to the president's desk. And this is one particular bill in 2007, and you can see what parts got into the Housing and Economic Recovery Act. And in general, I'm interested in extending backward and forward in Congress, multiple Congresses, or even into things like model legislation or white papers or policy papers to really see where bill ideas are made, where bill ideas or policy ideas are born. So I wanted to spend the last uh, uh, couple of minutes just telling you a little bit of what I hope to work on. I'm really hoping to get your feedback on the rest of the day today or uh, elsewhere uh, in touch. So uh, in government data, in the beginning, there were all these PDFs. Uh, or maybe before that, uh, government started to put data online, but it was difficult to parse, difficult to understand. And then as a result of a lot of efforts of journalists and open government advocates and civic hackers and open source projects, a lot of leaders of whom are in this room, there's been a lot of success in obtaining, cleaning, parsing, structuring government data. As a small tangent, I think uh, for me as a PhD student in computer science, there's an opportunity to work on what I'm calling automatic structure recovery, possibly to help with this uh, process. But beyond that, now that this data is available, now that this data is open, there's potentially new opportunities for new kinds of data science type analyses and visualizations for understanding government, whether it's things like tracing the trajectory of policies in Congress with this Bill Tracer project, or things like perhaps uh, mapping the cross-citation structure in the United States Code, or another project we worked on last year to try to unmask the authorship of unsigned per curiam Supreme Court opinions. Uh, so these are some things that might be possible with the data available today. I'd be very interested in continuing the discussion with you. Thanks very much for your time. This stuff is so cool. I had like 50 ideas already and we still have three speakers left. Um, so uh, next up, I'd like to invite Yu Wang, who I've not only, I've learned a ton about the Chinese context, but also I'm just consistently impressed by his ability to get stuff done. Yu. Hello, everybody. I will spend some time introducing how crowdsourcing works in our project, the NGO 2 project. We work with Chinese NGOs or nonprofit organizations, and we provide solutions to their communication needs, technology needs, and resource needs. Today, I will showcase two of these 10 projects under this umbrella, our crowdsourced map and the field guide to softwares for NGOs. This is our map. In this map, every NGO can register on the map and publish their events or projects or update their information. And they can also find corporation res social responsibility information and best practice practices of corporation and NGO partnerships. The interesting thing is that when an NGO first used our map at the very first time, they start to locate themselves within the map and see what's happening in their surroundings. One NGO from Hunan province found that, found that there is exactly another NGO just, just 
in their next door working in the same area, but they have never heard of that before. So this map may provide opportunities for participation or collaboration, or at least let NGOs know each other. And not only NGOs can find other NGOs, NGOs can also find co corporations for potential fundings, and the corporations can find the NGOs if they want to do some corporate social responsibility work. And the small companies, they can search for the big players, such as China Mobile, to find what they are doing with the social responsibility. And in the current version of the map, we allow NGOs to mark their coll collaborative relationships in the map so they can sh see a net graph showing their impact or influence in this country. And another thing is our workshop. We, this is our 10th workshop on Web 2.0 technologies for Chinese NGOs held in, in Guizhou province. And during, this is our curriculum. We teach them how to build social media strategies and how to use the information communication technologies and how to use cloud-based tools for their organizational management. And in the last part, we have our nonprofit toolbox. This toolbox, or the field guides for softwares to NGOs, is a cross-sourced platform that everybody can write a piece of article about software, which could be used by the NGOs for nonprofit use. Currently, it has more than 130 articles in that. And during the workshop, we ask our participants to select a maximum of six articles to build their own tool set that's suitable, the most suitable for their own needs. Here is the result of what one organization did. They picked up these five tools for their use. They include OneNote, Microsoft OneNote for collaborative note-taking, and YY. That's interesting because it's a voice communication platform initially used by the online gamers in such as Warcraft, but the NGOs started to use that for the team training, something like that. And Mike CRM, that's a free online customer relationship management tool to manage their volunteers and founders. And the WeChat is a mobile app to, you know, to communicate within a group. And finally, our NGO map. So this is how the crowdsourcing works with us. And you can follow our, our Twitter or ask questions so I can answer you. Or if you have Weibo account, you can also follow that. Thanks. So next up, I want to invite Ed Bice, who is working on the Midan project, which I think not only myself, but a lot of other folks in this room are following. Ed. Thanks, Rebel. Um, hey, everybody. I am uh, Ed Bice. Uh, I work at Medan with a bunch of really remarkable people in San Francisco, Vancouver, Cairo, Tucson, Brazil, most other corners of the world as well. Um, we're thrilled to be uh, a Knight Prototype Award winner for our Check Desk project. I'm not going to talk to you about Check Desk today, though. I'm going to talk to you about a really fascinating project um, that, like many of the fascinating and wonderful things in my life, is downstream of an email from Ethan. So I have to acknowledge that. Um, Paul Salapek is a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist who is, I mean, in, in, in this era of the, uh, the uh, five minute half life of a tweet, we're doing a digital project with Paul that spans seven years and uh, uh, traces a 21,000-mile arc uh, around the world. Uh, Paul is literally walking the path of human migration, uh, and, and this will take seven years. He'll cover 21,000 miles, and Medan is along for the ride. Um, we are following Paul, and every 100 miles along this uh, route, 
Paul is uh, filing a dispatch. Um, when Paul files his dispatches, he's, he's, he's sometimes stopping in some of the most remote and desolate places in the world. Um, turns out that much of the world is empty and desolate. But uh, along the way, almost everyone he encounters is connected to the internet. It's through satellite phones or, or, or mobile devices. Uh, along the way, there is a, is, is a parallel conversation that's, that's, uh, that's happening on the internet. So, uh, we are uh, aggregating, curating, and translating these thin sections through the global social media. So, imagine, imagine this as uh, you know, modern archaeology. Uh, we're, we're, we're taking 100-mile samples around the path of human migration. So, how, how are we doing this? Um, first, we're working with Todd Mostak and, and MAPD uh, to geo-bound and temporally bound uh, an initial data set of social media. So, uh, the, the workflow is on, gets a, a message from Paul or Patrick, and, and they say, okay, well, here's, the, here's the lat long of our next coordination, uh, of, of where we're going to be in two days. We then kind of build this data set, and then, like any good scrappy nonprofit, we figure that, well, we should make use of tools we already have. So we hacked the uh, Checkdesk platform. You see, here's, here's Checkdesk, which is uh, basically an annotation framework that allows journalists to create a change log verifying social media. So we're using this to uh, uh, create translations and create an embeddable object with those translations. Um, uh, and, and we're also using it to, we hacked it to create uh, some translation notes. You can see here uh, the, the uh, content, the translation, and then translation notes that provide some context. So, um, it's, it's uh, the, the resulting, uh, we, we sort from 10,000 uh, pieces of social media down to 50 or 100, translate those, and the, the, the kind of editorial prerogative is, is anything that's poignant, mundane, inspiring, you know, uh, or, or, you know, uh, trivial. So anything. We just want to provide what we think is a thin section across this, uh, these sample points. So why are we doing this? Big picture. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to provide some backwards context and then some forward context. Um, this is Mona Safe's Facebook page. Uh, it's really important. If you want to understand Egypt, you should be able to understand this Facebook page. And um, uh, Mona's brother is uh, the blogger and technologist, Ella. Um, so you, you see her profile picture here, three jailed Egyptian activists. Um, can't read it. We've been working at Medan since I think the first uh, social media translation project that we did um, uh, was 2008, and and here's a um, and then 2009 we did a Farsi translation project translating tweets. Um, I mean this is so poetic. We place our feet in our own step, uh, own footsteps, and we set like the sun. Um, this was in in Farsi. Would never have been, never would have reached outside that language community. We also did a lot of work around the, uh, obviously around Arab Spring, having an office in Cairo. The whole project started with a partnership with IBM Foundation. We created one of the first cross-lingual websites um, way back in the day. So, where we're headed with this project, um, the forward context. So, a seven-year project, uh, National Geographic is supporting Paul in his walk. Uh, we're, we're bringing in resource behind the technical side of this. Um, seven years gives us... To, I think, think where the web's going to be in seven years. As Paul traces this arc of human migration, we're going to trace this arc of creating the cross-lingual web. And, uh, and this, this is... I want to close with this, and, and then I want to read... A, a tweet that's going to be sent about something that I said so that I'll actually say it so it can be accurately tweeted. Um, <laughs> this is a beautiful quote. 
And, um, and it goes to the heart of the, you know, what we've been talking about over these last two days, which is the, the importance of the connected web. Um, this was translated by my colleague, Anis Katesh, at Anis. And, and um, it, 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 there, there is a parallel that we haven't talked about at all in these two days, and the parallel is language. Language is just as important as connectivity. Language is an access issue. It, 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 we're, we're isolated. Um, uh, the World Wide Web is, is a thousand siloed webs right now, and it won't be open until translation is baked into the structure of the web. So we need to work with Facebook, we need to work with Twitter, we need to work with Mozilla to bake this in so that communities can collaborate to translate important content. Thanks very much. Great. So uh, last up, we have Dan, Harlow, and Allison talking about the amazing hackathon that happened right before the conference started. Thanks. So yeah, hi. I'm Dan Sinker. I'm the director of the Knight Mozilla Open News Project. We're helping to build and strengthen the community uh, that is uh, coding in and around journalism. And one of the things we've done for the last three years uh, in advance of this conference, thanks to the support of the Center and the Knight Foundation, is run a hack weekend. Uh, two days, Saturday and Sunday, uh, we grab folks that are going to be coming to the conference and we give them the opportunity to, to build and collaborate together. Um, this year we had six really great teams and I wanted to just uh, give Allison Hurt and Harlow Holmes a chance to talk about uh, two of the projects that came out of this weekend's hack weekend. Um, hi, I'm Allison, and um, so when uh, Russia annexed Crimea, um, there was a bit of discussion reports in the news about how on the Russian version of Google Maps, uh, google.ru, um, they saw a version of the map that showed a very solid line um, separating uh, Ukraine from Crimea, indicating like, you know, Russia owns this now. But other versions of the map, like the US version of the map or the Ukrainian version of the map, showed actually a dotted line um, showing kind of more more of a dispute. So um, for uh, this hack day, we were looking kind of exploring that and looking at other possible other disputed territories. Um, so we started with a data set of, um, of disputed uh, territories around the world, narrowed that down to ones that actually showed something interesting on different versions of Google Maps, um, and built a site. Um, so here are a couple of examples. Um, where you see it most often, I mean, most of the time, um, disputed areas are just represented with dotted lines across like all the versions of Google Maps that we were seeing. But particularly in cases of like India, China, Russia, where there were disputes, the Chinese version might be totally different from the Indian version, and not really necessarily reflecting, um, you know, sort of the dotted line that this is a dispute. It's a solid line. This is this is our view, of our fact on, the, our, you know, our our version of the facts. Um, it was kind of fascinating. I mean, granted, I'm coming from a, you know, a U.S. perspective, and like Google Maps is from a U.S. perspective, you know, kind of the, the notion that kind of what is fact is kind of different depending on where you're at. Um, and kind of in closing, like one thing that was kind of fascinating looking at the Google version or the Chinese version of Google Maps is there's this dotted line that kind of like, you know, the very solid line of Google's board, of uh, China's borders, but also a, very, a dotted line kind of going down, like down past the Philippines and around Taiwan and like definitely sort of like, you know, this is ours and um, kind of declaring ownership, um, which is just kind of fascinating. Anyway, um, our project URL is here and the code is up on GitHub. Hi, I'm Harlow. Um, I'm going to tell you about a project that we did. It's called Keebler. We built an ad hoc network, big whoop, right? However, this is actually a story about remediation. And so I'm going to talk about something that inspired me to, uh, to do this. Um, back in the aughts, there's a technology that was called Wizzy Digital Courier. It came out of uh, South Africa and parts of Zimbabwe. And its purpose was to connect schools when the internet went down with a capital I, as it often did. And the way that it did was by, um, there was a router in a truck. The truck would drive up to a school. The school knew how to associate to the router. It would put all of its email and you know extra data onto it. The router then would um, send the, sc the school's network, you know, the email and correspondence that was for it, drive off to another school, lather, rinse, repeat. And this was actually a really, really great way of shuttling around information 
station when the grid went down. So we decided to use, how, or the goal was, um, how can we creatively, using tools at our disposal, remediate such a network? So Keebler is actually, if you hear, a play on words. Um, if you can imagine a router like this that like sits up in a tree, but like there are like all these elves inside that are actually you know passing your data around. Um, so it, uh, yeah, back to remediation. On this box is a piece of really awesome software called OpenWRT, OpenWRT, which is pretty much a Unix uh, OS for a router. And um, <clears throat> what we did then was we actually combined that with the idea of a bulletin board. So you know how there's public messages, all of the messages are encrypted. Maybe if you know Adam Langley from Google's um, project called Pond, this might sound familiar to you. Uh, some of the all of the messages are encrypted. The ones that are for you, you get. The ones that you aren't for you, well, you can't really do anything with them. And then we threw a third thing on top of that, which was Git, um, uh, well, SVN or whatever, and actually uh, via um, other packages that allowed for syncing instantaneously. So all of the stuff that was on, you know, the uh, in the repository was shared uh, immediately and synced between mobile clients that were connected to our network. This was really, really fun and really easy to do. Uh, here's the team. Uh, the five of us here are uh, um, current or former Knight Mozilla fellows. However, I, I want to give out a, a shout out to uh, Hazen, who is a interloper, uh, an independent journalist from Turkey, uh, who, while she was not a coder, looked at exactly how um, easily we mobilized and put together this project in such little time and thought, you know, I could bring this home and just with a little knowledge, we can just share the knowledge of how easy something like this can be. Thank you. So awesome. Now that your brains are full, uh, thanks very much. And Ethan's going to bring us to a close. Wait a second. Don't go anywhere. I, I, first of all, uh, can we get a round of applause for the amazing folks who just presented during this? Look, this job that I have here uh, is about as much fun as you can have and be employed by an academic institution. And it's because we get to work with people like this all the time. It's absolutely wonderful. And as Rahul has been really good about saying on this, you've got the opportunity to work with them as well. Everybody who presented here needs help on these projects, needs help on trying to bring them further. Please find people over lunch, after the conference, push things further. Let's also get a round of applause for the guy who not only put this session together, but has a hand in something like 80% of those projects, Rahul Bhargav, who's just done an incredible job of really kicking into an extra gear the research we're doing here. I couldn't do this job without him. It's amazing to have the chance to work with him. Everybody, we've got...